lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, Bay and Bravo. Well, thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the February 6th, 2019 edition of Space News. We're glad to be back and looking forward to an exciting year. It's the 50th anniversary of man's first step on the moon, and also hopefully Americans will be launching Americans into space from the US. So uh, that's great. It's going to be an exciting year. So once again, this is Peter Aylward, and once again, I have Michael Abdullah and Angela de Gratz here with me from the Space Association. And we're going to start off with Space News from Australia. Gold Coast-based Gilmore Space has announced a new rocket and launch platform ahead of a suborbital test flight. Australian rocket company Gilmore Space Technologies last week unveiled its One Vision rocket. It plans to launch later this month and conducted a live demonstration of its automated mobile launcher, the first of its kind in Australia. One Vision is a scaled version of our Ariel-class suborbital rocket and its main objective will be to flight test our proprietary hybrid rocket engine for commercial orbital launches starting in 2020, explained the company's CEO and founder, Adam Gilmore. The 9-metre tall rocket will carry payloads from universities in Australia and Singapore and is scheduled to launch from a private property in far north Queensland later in February. Hopefully the rain will stop by then. The company is in the final stages of obtaining launch approvals from the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. The coming launch will also be a test of the company's new mobile launch platform and ground control station. There are currently no commercial launch sites for orbital launches in Australia and so Gilmore's mobile system will enable it to launch from remote areas in Australia and elsewhere. Gilmore Space believes that a dedicated commercial launch site in Queensland could form the cornerstone of upstream space manufacturing in Queensland and Australia. And in New Zealand, Rocket Lab is planning to increase the staff located at its New Zealand launch site. The company currently has 20 employees operating its launch site on the Maha Peninsula, but plans to grow that to 30 by the end of the year. The jobs available range from engineers and technicians to a logistics assistant. Rocket Lab is ramping up its launch activity in New Zealand with plans to perform 12 launches, about one a month, of its Electron rocket this year. Angelo, what's happening over the US? Okay, well, glad to be back again. We go straight into US space policy. An independent space force could still eventually emerge from proposals being drafted by the White House. A space policy directive to be issued in the coming weeks from President Trump is expected to call for the formation of a space force within the US Air Force. Now that's a slightly different slant to an independent arm of the military. So, interesting development. However, that directive is also expected to state that this will be a first step towards a future military department for national security space and require regular reviews by the Secretary of Defence about the need for a separate department of the Space Force. Creating the Space Force within the Air Force is thought to be an easier path to win approval from Congress by reducing the costs of establishing it, which was one of the reasons why uh, they probably couldn't get a Space Force up and running in the first place. Further, Acting Defence Secretary Patrick Shanahan later also confirmed that the Pentagon's proposal for the Space Force will place it within the Air Force. Speaking with reporters, Shanahan said he plans to continue to oversee the space reorganisation that started last year when he was Deputy Secretary of Defence. That includes a proposal to establish a Space Force within the Air Force, which will be included in the Pentagon's 2020 budget proposal. He called it the most efficient approach to establish a space force. It's going to be small, as small as possible, a footprint. He added that he had identified a four-star officer, wonder who that is, to serve as head of the new US Space Command, but didn't disclose the name of that planned nominee. Okay, Michael, welcome and off to planetary. Thanks, Angelo. NASA's Parker Solar Probe has completed its first lap around the sun. 
The spacecraft, launched last August, made a close approach to the Sun in early November before reaching aphelion, or the greatest distance from the Sun in its orbit, on January 19. The spacecraft has returned some of the data collected during that close approach, with the rest due back before its next swing-by of the Sun in early April. That upcoming flyby, like the first one, will bring the spacecraft to within 24 million kilometres of the Sun, but future flybys will take it as close as 6 million kilometres. Meanwhile, NASA is making new and potentially final efforts to restore communications with the Mars rover Opportunity. JPL announced recently that it would send new commands to the rover to address low likelihood events that could be keeping the rover from transmitting back to Earth. Controllers have not heard from Opportunity since June when a massive dust storm deprived the rover of solar power. The project manager for Opportunity acknowledged that the probability of ever hearing from the rover again is decreasing each day, but that the project will continue every effort to do so. Meanwhile, scientists used NASA's Curiosity rover to measure the mass of the mountain it is climbing on Mars. Researchers used tiny changes in gravity tracked by the rover as it climbed Aeolus Mons, also known as Mount Sharp, in the middle of Gale Crater, to weigh the mountain. Those measurements indicated that the mountain was not as massive as originally thought because it is more th- porous. Scientists think that that could be explained if the bottom part of the mountain is made of sediments left behind by an ancient lake there and the top part made of particles deposited by winds. Over to you, Angelo. Thanks, Mike. Let's go across to Russia. A recent problem with a Soyuz upper stage could delay next month's scheduled launch of the first set of OneWeb's satellites. A Russian space industry source said that technicians had found a microhole in a pipe in the helium pressurization system of the rocket's Fregat upper stage. Not long after, workers were able to repair it. The problem is likely to delay the launch, however, currently scheduled for mid-February to probably March. However, no mention of any change in launch plans have been formally announced. That launch will carry the first six satellites of OneWeb's broadband satellite constellation. Russia's new Vostochny Cosmodrome is a launch site in search of a mission. Roscosmos opened the site to Western reporters for the first time last month to witness a Soyuz launch from there. Vostochny currently only has launch facilities for the Soyuz 2 rocket and progress on pads for the Angara rocket family has been slow going. The Soyuz facilities are modern and streamlined, but how frequently the remote site will be used remains uncertain. While the spaceport has been controversial, the project has become the sole source of hope for better work and economic opportunity in the region. Back to you, Mike. Okay, let's look at China. China's Chang'e 4 lunar lander is operating after awaking from a two-week night on the far side of the moon. The lander resumed operations last week, a day after the U-2 rover woke up shortly after sunrise at its landing site. Temperatures at the site reached minus 190 degrees Celsius, colder than expected. Chinese scientists said differences in lunar soil composition compared to the near side could explain the colder temperatures. Meanwhile, the main contractor for the Chinese space program is planning more than 30 launches in 2019. The China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation said those launches would carry more than 50 spacecraft, although the company did not disclose a full launch manifest. The planned missions include the return to flight of the Long March 5 in July, carrying the Xi'an 20 communication satellite to be followed late in the year by the Chang'e 5 lunar sample return mission. 
10 Beidou navigation satellites will be launched over the course of 2019. China will also attempt its first launch from a ship with a Long March 11 launching in June to demonstrate the ability to reach low inclination orbits. Moving to India. India's space agency ISRO has opened a centre for its new human spaceflight program. The human spaceflight centre, located in Bengaluru, adjacent to ISRO headquarters, will be devoted to development of the country's Gagyan crewed spacecraft. ISRO plans to launch the first crewed Gagayan mission by the end of 2021, ahead of a 2022 goal announced last year by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Okay, Peter. All right, uh, moving over to the Middle East, Israeli Aerospace Industries, AIA, is teaming up with a German company, OHB, to offer commercial lunar lander services. The company has announced last week that they had signed a teaming agreement with OHB serving as a prime contractor and interface with customers and with IAI providing a lander based on one of on the one built for the Space IL, the former Google Lunar X Prize team, scheduled to launch next month. The companies foresee European Space Agency as the initial customer for those services. Pending a decision at this November's ministerial meeting on the agency's lunar plans. Back to you, Angelo. Okay, let's go back to the United States and SpaceX. Permit applications recently made by SpaceX confirms that the company is planning its next Falcon Heavy launch for no sooner than early March. Filings with the FCC sought communication license for both the Falcon Heavy launch itself as well as landings of the three booster cores. The launch of the Arabsat 6A satellite will be the second flight of the Falcon Heavy, which made its debut last February. Another Falcon Heavy launch, reusing the same set of booster cores, is scheduled for the next quarter for the long-delayed Air Force Space Test Program 2 mission. Looking forward to that one, that's for sure. Again, moving on to SpaceX, Mr. Steven missed it by that much. SpaceX released a video last week of a recent test of the ability of a ship named Mr. Steven to catch a Falcon 9 payload fairing in a giant net. In the test, the fairing was dropped by a helicopter gliding under a parachute towards a ship. The fairing landed in the net deployed above the ship only to fall off and hit the water. SpaceX has been conducting these tests in efforts to be able to recover and reuse payload fairings. Latest reports indicate that Mr. Stephen is en route to the East Coast, presumably to attempt fairing captures of the upcoming launches, including those of the Falcon Heavy. Won't that be a sight to see, an attempt to land all three boosters and capture each of the fairing halves? Looking forward to that. Moving on, still in America, to Blue Origin. Talisat has selected Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket for launching its low Earth orbit broadband constellation. The companies announced a multi-launch agreement last week, but did not disclose the specific number of launches or satellites to be launched covered by the deal. Talisat is preparing a constellation of roughly 300 communication satellites for global internet connectivity services and plans to select a manufacturer later this year. Blue Origin has eight New Glenn missions in its backlog from four other customers, with the rocket's first launch scheduled for 2021. Meanwhile, Blue Origin broke ground recently on a factory in Alabama that will produce its BE-4 engines. The company selected Huntsville as a site for the factory in 2017, but waited until United Launch Alliance selected the engine for its Vulcan rocket before committing to building the factory. The factory will produce BE-4 engines for both Vulcan and Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket and will also produce BE-3U engines used on New Glenn's second stage. 
The factory, set to be completed in March 2020, will create more than 300 jobs with a total company investment of more than $200 million. Blue Origin also announced it is finalising an agreement with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Centre to do acceptance testing of the engines at a test stand there. Great, uh, great news. All right, Peter. Well, that's it for space news of uh, this week. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on back and look forward to the year ahead. And it's back to you, 